1953, two men camp outside Joshua Tree National Park when strange lights come down from the sky. I couldn't get up, they had me frozen. I tried because I knew something was going on. One of the men disappears for 25 minutes. When he returns, he claims to have had an alien encounter. They had implanted in his mind a design for a building, almost like a time machine, where people would walk through it and the cells of their body would be rejuvenated. This is National Park Secrets and Legends. Joshua Tree National Park is an 800,000 square acre expanse in California's Mojave Desert. Here, temperatures soar to over 100 degrees, and there's only five inches of rain each year. In Joshua Tree, all life hangs in a precarious balance. But some believe that despite the harsh terrain, the park contains mysterious forces, and that a strange and powerful creature roams in the desert landscape. February 1971, at an Air Force base near the perimeter of Joshua Tree National Park, a Marine guard is attacked by a terrifying, gigantic monster. It came running at him at a ferocious speed, knocked him to the ground. He went unconscious, and when he came to, the weapon that he was carrying with him was twisted and bent all out of shape. That same day on a residential road at the edge of the park, people awakened to the sounds of dogs barking. Residents describe not one, but two of the same beasts that took down the Marine Guard, a Bigfoot-like creature with light-colored hair. Locals call him Yucca Man, and he is a regular terrifying sight. They've seen this thing outside of their homes, uh, it looking into their windows. One woman said that she could hear him every once in a while pounding on the back of her air conditioner. She would go out the next day and she said underneath the air conditioner, there was a giant uh, footprint. Yucca Man has been described uh, as being between seven and a half and eight feet tall, covered with hair, usually tan or white. He has tremendous power. I understand in one case he actually even shook a car and almost lifted it off the, uh, the roadway. Locals living near Joshua Tree National Park have sighted Yucca Man many times, spanning several decades. It's a pretty well-known established fact to people who live there to not go out at night because these things may attack you. Joshua Tree National Park sprawls over 1,200 square miles of southeastern California. But the place where Yucca Man appears is a tiny area that has long been a hub for unusual phenomena. At the park's edge is the largest boulder in the world. Some believe that with its enormous size comes unimaginable power. Giant Rock is the largest single boulder in North America. It's seven stories tall. It weighs 40 or 50 tons. And it was used going back by the uh, Native uh, Americans in that area. For hundreds of years, Native American shamans have performed sacred rituals at Giant Rock, as if drawn by a strange, invisible force. There's something about the magnetic pull of the Earth and the fact that there are all sorts of minerals there that seems to create a vortex. And so for hundreds of years, people have been going there for mystical experiences. In the early 1930s, Giant Rock lures a man from Germany who is drawn to Joshua Tree's unique landscape and the glitter of gold. Frank Kritzer was an immigrant from Germany. He came over shortly after World War I. Kritzer is a prospector who has come to Joshua Tree in search of the next bonanza. He is inexplicably drawn to Giant Rock and decides to settle there. Over the next few years, he excavates a small room beneath the rock, making it his permanent home. But with the outbreak of World War II, this reclusive German comes under scrutiny. Because of the fact that he had a giant antenna on top of giant rock that went up into the heavens, some of the neighbors thought that there was something suspicious about Frank. Perhaps he had some sympathies still to uh, Germany and to Hitler. So they called the police and a couple of deputies showed up to interview him. 
he refuses to let them into his subterranean home. And after a brief standoff, the sheriffs take action. They lobbed some tear gas uh, under the rock, and apparently it ignited some dynamite caps that he had there. So Frank went up in a blaze of uh, glory. It turned out, of course, that he had no ties to uh, Germany uh, whatsoever. Kritzer's death shocks a close friend, George Van Tassel. Van Tassel has visited him many times at Giant Rock, and like Kritzer, is strangely drawn to it, as if by an unseen force. George was so mesmerized by the, uh, the area and, and the feeling and the vibrations that he got there and the solitude, he decided to move and take over the Giant Rock. Daniel Boone is Van Tassel's son-in-law. For over 60 years, he has lived near Giant Rock. Now in his 80s, he speaks mostly through his son, Matthew. It was August 24th, 1953. Van Tassel and his son-in-law decide to sleep outside, right next to Giant Rock. You know, in August, it's very hot, so they just throw a bag down somewhere, you know, and get some sleep. And they were there, and they were sleeping outside. And uh, he was awakened by buzzing and a pulsating light. And he realized that this ship had, had come down or something was going on. Joshua Tree National Park a remote desert wilderness in southeastern California. At its outskirts is Giant Rock, the largest boulder in the world, which some believe has mysterious powers. This strange energy compels a California engineer named George Van Tassel to move his family here, where he comes face to face with the park's secrets. One evening in 1953, Van Tassel's son-in-law, Daniel Boone, camps out with him right next to Giant Rock. Strange lights come down from the sky. Suddenly, Van Tassel disappears, and his son-in-law finds himself paralyzed by a force he cannot describe. I couldn't get up to have me frozen. I tried because I knew something was going on, but I could move my head. And the ship, with the pulsation that Dad could see and everything like that, the ship never actually left. The ship stayed there. George went on board, but they didn't, they didn't take off and take him anywhere else. 25 terrifying minutes pass. Then Van Tassel suddenly comes out of the darkness with an amazing story of an encounter with an alien life form. He began to actually communicate with these beings through mental telepathy. He also started uh, channeling these uh, being some other dimensions and other realms and other planets. Incredibly, George explains that he's been given instructions to build a unique structure near Joshua Tree National Park. George claims they had implanted in his mind a design for a building, which he came to call the Integratron. Now, this was supposed to be a, 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 a healing center where people would walk through it and the cells of their body would be rejuvenated. The purpose was a gift of longevity. George asked for longevity, and they said, we're supposed to live into the hundreds. It's claimed that the aliens also told Van Tassel that by living longer, humans will be able to contribute more to their society. But why build the Integratron at the edge of Joshua Tree National Park? Yeah, they need a power source uh, that goes in alignment with the plans of the building, so it needed to be set in a certain location. This area is crisscrossed with hundreds of fault lines, more than any other national park in the United States. Some believe these cracks in the earth exert a unique magnetic energy. Where they cross, there's an incredible amount of energy there. So the center of the building itself is actually where two of these magnetic lines cross. So um, that's why they chose the location for the Integratron to be built there. The Integratron is to be built three miles from Giant Rock. To fund it, Van Tassel decides to hold the world's first UFO convention to raise awareness about his experience. Within a few years, the annual event is drawing up to 10,000 people. It was really remarkable. You would have thousands of people out here. And there would be tents, there would be um, campers, there would be planes flying in and out. Year after year, with money coming from his UFO conventions, Van Tassel labors at the Integratron. He builds the giant dome entirely of wood, 
without a single metal part, not even a single nail. George would receive these messages to go on to the next step. When he completed one step, then he would get the message to go on to the next one. Finally, in January 1978, George announces that the Integratron is only one step away from completion. But his strange building draws unwanted attention. George told me, he says, guess what, Boone? I had an office of naval intelligence, two admirals come out here with plain clothes and tell me to shut it down. Three weeks later, Van Tassel dies of an apparent heart attack. Until this day, his lifelong project still remains unfinished. The government uh, and military, if, if there's going to be something fantastic out there, they're the first ones to want to get their hands on it, and they, they don't want any of that kind of technology in the hands of civilians. Van Tassel's Integratron is a permanent monument to his alleged encounter with an alien race. And he's not the only one who claims to have spotted a UFO in the park's clear desert skies. We felt this mechanical pulsing hum. And as we all looked up towards the sky, a pyramid-shaped craft seemed to appear. This energy field around it was palpable. Joshua Tree National Park is over 1,200 square miles of fragile wilderness, home to plants and creatures that survive on the edge of a desert void. The park is also famed for being a hotbed of UFO activity, an apparent magnet for alleged sightings and extraterrestrial encounters. July 8, 1986. Just outside Joshua Tree National Park in California's Mojave Desert, a family is awakened in the dead of night. I remember uh, waking up and it was very dark in the house and listening to the sounds of the pictures and uh, other items on the wall as they vibrated around. I could hear my mom screaming, earthquake, and everyone out. It felt like someone was heading towards us. The earthquake, it was a salt 6, 6.1, which is a decent sized earthquake. So my mom uh, decided that we were going to stay outside and uh, wait it out. As Zane and his parents adjust to the complete darkness, they see something unusual in the clear sky above the park. I personally began to notice uh, very unique lights in the sky. I would say these two lights, and they would fly at each other, and they would swirl around each other, and then they would instantly zip back and return to position. And they would do this over and, and over again. The lights draw closer. Then, Zane and his family hear a low humming sound until a strange flying machine is directly above them. We felt this mechanical pulsing hum. And as we all looked up towards the sky, a pyramid-shaped craft seemed to appear. Uh, we all just looked up into the center of it. A uh, beam of light just kind of flashed down on us, and it seemed to permeate everything around us. And uh, it lasted for seconds. And it almost is a flooding bright white light that kind of encompassed everything around you. Even though it feels like seconds to Zane, somehow, inexplicably, hours pass. The next thing we know, it's a little later in the morning. Uh, you can definitely tell the sun is rose. There was some time that had gone by. To this day, what happened to Zane and his family during those few hours remains a mystery. There wasn't any excitement. We didn't discuss what had uh, occurred. It just seemed like we were all very calm and that we knew it was now safe to go back inside. And so we all went back inside of the house. Zane Radford is not the first in his family to experience UFO sightings at Joshua Tree National Park. My grandmother, uh, my mother, and my mother's younger sister, uh, my aunt, my half-sister, the Radford family's encounters with UFOs date back a century. 
Michael Radford believes that for some unknown reason, his family has been chosen to be visited across several decades. They do have uh, interest in certain lineages. Uh, I don't know what the family connection is, I don't know what the generational thing is, but apparently it can run in families. Barbara Lamb is a therapist who has treated 800 people for apparent alien encounters, many at Joshua Tree National Park. They seem to be choosing generally healthy people, they're intelligent, they're bright. Some of these extraterrestrials seem to be following genetic lines. So you might have an experiencer um, now who is, say, middle-aged, and that experiencer might realize that somebody else in the family has been having these experiences, uh, particularly one of the parents. When Radford talked with his family about their experiences, he saw an eerie pattern. It was mostly the women being targeted. Therapist Barbara Lamb thinks she knows why. The uh, aliens certainly do seem to do a reproductive program. Many women have eggs taken from their ovaries. And sometimes they do it through the navel. Sometimes they do it through an area right next to the navel. And in that case, there's usually a triangular-shaped bruise mark. And then they add some genetic material from their own extraterrestrial species. Then that mixture is implanted in the woman on another occasion, presumably during an abduction. It is an ongoing program, it is happening, that human females are being made pregnant with hybrid offspring. Joshua Tree National Park in southeastern California is home to a mysterious Bigfoot-like figure called Yucca Man, and also to UFO sightings and alien abductions that defy conventional belief. What is happening at the park that seems to make it a magnet for strange creatures and extraterrestrial activity? Some believe the answer lies in the area's geology. There are so many minerals uh, in the earth down around Joshua Tree, uh, gold and silver and all other kinds of rare minerals that can be found throughout the area. Uh, there's a belief that this is actually what is drawing these craft uh, down to this location. Evidence of these alien visits may be found in Sumerian tablets dated to 3000 BC and discovered in Iraq in 1850. Some believe the tablets refer to an alien species called the Anunnaki. According to researcher Lloyd Pye, the Anunnaki came seeking gold in Joshua Tree National Park 450,000 years ago in a desperate attempt to save their planet. They needed gold. They had damaged their very precious atmosphere. They needed to repair it, and the best way to do that was to take pulverized gold, blow it up into the upper atmosphere of their planet, and where it would reflect cosmic rays that would be damaging. But to extract the gold, the Anunnaki needed workers. Could the Yucca men have been created to work as Anunnaki slaves? Shockingly, Pai believes that the Yucca men had a very different and important role to play. Hominoids were the creatures of Earth. This was their planet before the arrival of the, of the Anunnaki to, to take over. But the Anunnaki recognize that the Yucca men are too powerful to become their servants on Earth, so they create a new slave race. The Anunnaki created humans to mine gold for them. The Anunnaki created us, but they made sure that we couldn't defeat them in any way, whether physically or mentally. But it's claimed that the humans had no immunity to Earth's diseases. So the Anunnaki had no choice but to take DNA from the Yucca men and mix it with our own. Mostly we have from them just the ability to fight off pathogens on this planet. If the Anunnaki were here long ago, what can explain the recent UFO activity at Joshua Tree National Park? Some believe the Anunnaki may be back.
but this time for a different reason. They are doing the reproductive program because they're trying to save their own race. Their own race has become infertile. Their own race cannot reproduce anymore. Their own race, they say, is dying out and they look to us humans for that. If the theory is correct, could it explain the existence of the Integratron? Is its alleged ability to prolong human lives part of an alien breeding program? Some believe the park has been a vital gateway between our planet and some other distant alien world for hundreds of thousands of years, a unique role that's as important now as it was since the dawn of humanity. The Anunnaki have been in steady contact with the Earth going back at least 400,000 years. I think that they're very much active uh, in Joshua Tree, and I think they do have interest here. <laughs>